Hi everyone, welcome back to the second portion of episode 3, Resting Membrane Potential. In the last episode, we discussed cross-membrane transport and the Nernst equation and equilibrium potential of single ions. In this episode, we are first going to look at the values of the concentration gradients of some ions, and then turn to the multi-ion case for the Nernst equation, namely the goldman hodgkin katz equation. We will call it the GHK equation from now on. Finally, we will be able to calculate the resting membrane potential. And finally, see how can we change the membrane potential experimentally. Again, the software Metaneuron is recommended to try out the concepts of permeability and resting membrane potential by yourself. Now, a quick review question. The Nernst equation describes the equilibrium between two forces exerted by which of these two things? A. The water shell around ions and the concentration gradient. B. The concentration gradient and the electric potential. C. The electric potential and ion pumps. And D. Ion pumps and water shell around ions. The answer is B the concentration gradient, and the electric potential. On the left side of the Nernst equation, we have the equilibrium potential of the ion, which is what the electrical potential gave us. On the right side, we have a bunch of constants times ln concentration of ion outside over concentration of ion inside. And that describes the concentration gradient. In other words, the concentration outside versus inside. This is the table that we calculated last time. Let's look at the values of the concentration outside versus inside. Note that potassium is the only ion that has higher concentration inside than outside. This is a peculiarity because all the other ions, sodium, calcium, chlorine, all have higher concentration outside than inside. Calcium even has a 10,000 time difference between the concentration. Where are these ions distributed? These concentration gradients are maintained by ion pumps. For example, the sodium potassium pump pumps sodium out and pumps potassium in. And that is why there are more potassium ions inside the membrane. Calcium pumps pump calcium ions out of the cell and ergo the 10,000 time difference. The charges are mainly distributed on the surfaces of the cell membrane. Nearly all the other parts of the intracellular and extracellular fluid are neutral. On the sides of the membrane, we have negatively charged ions on one side and positively charged ions on the other side. This is because they have a force of attraction between each other, but they can't pass through. So they can only look at each other from the other side of the membrane. Thus, we can see that the neuronal membrane is somewhat like a capacitor in an electric circuit, where one plate has negative charge and the other plate has positive charge. Moreover, inside the cell, there are many negatively charged proteins. These are neutralized by potassium ions. As we may recall, there are many potassium ions inside the cell, and they serve to neutralize the proteins that are negatively charged. Now finally, we can get to the GHK equation. Before we go straight to the equation, we need to understand the concept of ion permeability. Ions are not free to flow across the membrane. As you may recall, they require facilitated diffusion. That is to say, we need ion channels. More specifically, we need ion leak channels. Ion leak channels are always open and they allow ions to pass through freely. This is in contrast with gated ion channels, which are sometimes closed and open to specific stimuli. The number of ion leak channels determines how freely the ion can go through the membrane. If there are only a few ion leak channels, then the ion would find it very hard to pass the membrane. If, however, there are more, then the ion will be very permeable to the membrane and they will have a greater impact to the resting membrane potential than the other ions. We can now get to the goldman hodgkin katz equation, the multi-ion case of the Nernst equation. 
This is the most general form of the GHK equation. There are several differences from the Nernst equation. First, the n that stands with f in the Nernst equation is now obliterated. For one, the n that stands with f in the Nernst equation is now missing. In fact, we assume that all the cations and anions here only have charge positive 1 or negative 1. Secondly, there is a sum of the concentration of ions inside the ln function. Moreover, cations have concentration out above the line, while anions have concentration in above the line. And finally, we see coefficients that are called p ions. These p are just permeability, and they describe how permeable the ion is to the membrane. The higher the value of p, the more permeable the ion. Therefore, it makes sense that if p is larger, then the coefficient is larger, and the concentration of this ion will have a greater impact on the value of the whole fraction. This is a more simplified form of the above equation that accounts for only potassium ions, sodium ions, and chlorium ions. And finally, we have a simplissimal form that only has potassium ions and sodium ions. The alpha here is actually equal to p and a over p k. So it is still a description of the relative permeability of sodium to potassium. Using these equations, we can calculate the whole resting membrane potential. There are many, much, a lot more potassium leak channels than sodium leak channels in the cell membrane. Therefore, the membrane potential is about minus 70 microvolts, which is closer to potassium's equilibrium potential than to sodium's. This is imaginable. Potassium is much more permeable than sodium, so it is natural that the membrane potential is closer to potassium's potential than to sodium's. In some textbooks, you may see some other values for the resting membrane potential. For example, you may see minus 65 microvolts. There is only a small difference between these values, and these may be due to methodological differences or simply differences between individual cells. So any value that is close to minus 70 microvolts is acceptable. It is recommended that you remember minus 70 microvolts. After all, it is an integer multiple of 10. The minus sign in minus 70 microvolts is with respect to the outer side of the membrane. That is to say, if the outer side of the membrane has charge 0 microvolt, then the inner side has minus 70 microvolts. The intracellular fluid has negative charge compared to the extracellular fluid. Since the resting membrane potential is very susceptible to the changes in extracellular potassium, we need to protect neurons from excessive extracellular potassium. This is accomplished through the blood-brain barrier. As you may recall from the episode of Neuron and Glia, the blood-brain barrier is formed by astrocytes. It is a barrier that surrounds the blood vessels in the brain and prevents harmful substances from entering the brain from the blood. The blood-brain barrier actually prevents excessive extracellular potassium that exists in the blood from entering the brain, thus protecting neurons. Astrocytes also carry out their function individually. They can absorb excessive potassium ions from one location, transport it all across its own cell body, and then distribute it to other places where there is lower concentration of potassium ions. Through this process, the potassium ion is diluted, and thus the cells are protected. However, muscles are also excitable, and they have a resting membrane potential. However, they are not protected from excessive extracellular potassium. This is why potassium chloride is a very harmful substance. If we take an intravenous injection of potassium chloride, then something terrible will happen. Flowing in the blood, the potassium will reach your heart muscles. And since your heart muscles are not protected, they will simply stop functioning. Your heart will stop beating. Well, that is why potassium chloride is a choice for some people to commit murders. That is not recommended, though. <laughs>
Question time. Which ion is the most permeable to the neuronal membrane? Is it sodium, chlorine, potassium, or calcium? This is an easy question, right? The answer is potassium. There are far more potassium leak channels on the neuronal membrane than the other ions. By the way, the least permeable ion is calcium, and that is very important for synaptic transmission. Second question. What would happen if we increase the number of chlorine leak channels in the neuronal membrane? A. The neuron will blow up. B. Solid sodium chloride crystals will form inside the cell. Mmm, yummy. C. Membrane potential would become less negative. And D. The potential would become more negative. The answer is D. Membrane potential would become more negative. This is because there is a higher concentration of chlorine ions outside the cell than inside the cell. Therefore, chlorine ions flow into the cell. As more chlorine ions enter, there is more negative charge inside the neuronal membrane, and thus membrane potential becomes more negative. This process is called hyperpolarization. We can divide this word into two parts, hyper and polarize. We say that neuronal membranes are polarized because there is a potential difference between the two sides of the membrane. Since the membrane potential becomes more negative, it is more polarized, thus the name hyperpolarization. In contrast, we also have depolarization, which means that the neuronal membrane is less polarized. That is to say, the membrane potential becomes less negative or even positive. Finally, how can we change the membrane potential experimentally? We have many different ways. For example, we can apply drugs. Some drugs bind to ligand-gated ion channels and open them. As ions start to flow, membrane potential is changed. For example, in this illustration, sodium ion channels open, and sodium flows in, thus depolarizing the neuron, making the membrane potential less negative. We can also inject a current directly. If we inject different ions, we get different results. Please keep in mind that in neurons and all biological systems, we don't have electricity conducted by free electrons. All the electrical currents are conducted by ions. For example, if we inject potassium ions into the cell, then the cell will depolarize. If we inject chlorine ions into the cell, then the cell will hyperpolarize. We also have more modern ways to change the membrane potential. For example, optogenetics. Optogenetics uses light to excite or inhibit the cell, i.e. to depolarize and hyperpolarize the cell. Optogenetics sometimes use ion channels or ion pumps as tools. For example, the protein on the left is the channel rhodopsin. It is a light-gated sodium ion channel. When we shine blue light on it, it opens up and allows sodium ions to flow into the cell, thus depolarizing the neuron. On the right side, we have halorhodopsin, which is a light-activated ion pump. When yellow light is shown on this protein, it pumps chlorine ions into the cell, thus hyperpolarizing the membrane potential. These are very useful in modern-day investigations especially in living organisms in vivo. To sum up, we have talked about the resting membrane potential in these two portions of episode 3. In the last episode, we discussed cross-membrane transport, which laid the foundation for all our subsequent discussions. And we deduced the Nernst equation and equilibrium potential for the single ions. In this episode, we examined the ionic concentration gradients there is more potassium inside the cell, and more sodium, calcium, and chlorine outside the cell. Then we looked at the gh quay equation, which is a form of the Nernst equation in multi-ionic form. Finally, we calculated the resting membrane potential and discussed its properties. And at last, we talked about how to change the membrane potential experimentally through injecting currents, applying drugs, or other methods such as optogenetics. In the next episode, we are going to go from the passive 
resting neuronal membrane to the active neuronal membrane. Let's get ready for some action. See you again in the next episode.